Hi everyone and uh, welcome to the second of our Movement and Skill Acquisition Ireland webinar series. Um, we, we hope everyone's safe and well wherever you are in the world. Um, Movement and Skill Acquisition Ireland is comprised of uh, Ed Collin, Phil Carney, Alan Dunton and myself, uh, Ollie Logan. And originally we had planned to have our uh, second conference in, in sunny Cork this time next week. However, we've all had to adapt to the dynamic environment. So we've decided to run a, a webinar series as a result. Um, so we're really, really fortunate that um, a number of our speakers have agreed to do some of these webinars with us. And we've got a great response from the first one uh, with Sarah Kelleher last week and uh, further, uh, further response um, with the, the Keith offering up his time to do it uh, this week as well. Um, we're really keen to maintain a level of interaction during these webinars, and that's why we've chosen to limit to 100 people. So if you do have a question for Keith today, please post it in the, uh, in the chat section, and um, Phil and, and Alan will, will monitor that. And what we'd like to do is, is after uh, Keith does his, his presentation, is, is hopefully come to you uh, and allow you to, to pose your question to Keith in person. So we'll, we'll unmute you uh, and allow you to do that. Um, due to the demand, we are, um, we're putting this on live stream out to YouTube today. So if you are watching on YouTube, then please do post any questions on the comments section uh, on the live stream and we'll monitor those and again, try and post those to Keith after he presents. Um, and again, what I've done for those of you in the webinar, put your microphone, microphones on mute. So, uh, and I'll unmute you um, when we're going uh, and allowing questions. Um, so in essence, it's uh, again, a big thanks to Keith for, for doing this and I'll, I'll hand over to Ed to introduce Keith and then we'll start with this presentation. Thanks, Ollie. Okay, great. Thanks, Ollie. And, and welcome to everybody. Um, it's, it is a great honour for all of us uh, in Movement and Skill Acquisition Ireland to have Keith uh, join us today. Keith has been an, an advocate and a support of ours, even as even a mentor to us um, since we, we, we began Movement and Skill Acquisition Ireland back in 2018. And I think, as you'll see over the next hour, his, his, his approach and his willingness to engage is, is, is fantastic because it brings more people into the conversation than, than, than not. Um, I think also from our perspective, it's, it's great to have somebody who has the capacity to be able to discuss the topics that we're talking about in, in a way from through his experience of all the people he engages with, the collaborators he engages with all over the world. So without further ado, it's a huge pleasure to, to introduce uh, Keith Davids from Sheffield Hallam University. Um, and welcome, Keith, and best of luck. Thank you. Great, great. Thanks, uh, thanks Ed, and good evening, everyone. And I hope everyone, is, uh, to echo what Ollie said, uh, I hope everyone's staying safe and healthy in the lockdown circumstances. We're, we're not far away from the end, hopefully. Um, anyway, um, what I'd like to do today is to... Uh, talk to um, a trilogy, um, uh, or the first part of a trilogy. I, mean, I don't know about everyone else, but I've been watching Netflix series, um, uh, a lot of them. And uh, yeah, so this is probably like series one. There's only one episode to each series, so don't get too excited about it. But um, I'm writing a paper with colleagues at the moment. As Ed said, I really do value collaboration uh, with sports practitioners, with academics, anyone who's interested and uh, wants to share knowledge and understanding uh, to develop our, um, our skills, whether we're academics or practitioners. Um, and I'm writing a paper at the moment on the relationship between specificity and generality of learning, training, practice. Um, there's lots of different um, uh, areas where specificity is a key principle of the work. Um, and so, um, yeah, so this is really, if you like, a, uh, the first part of it. And um, I'd be interested to hear what people think of it, uh, the ideas, and if they want to make any comments, uh, feel free to do so. So, Ollie, are you... Are you um, uh, Keith, just give it one more go. I think, uh, I think we managed to sort it. So try okay, to your right. screen there. Yeah, let's get this, get the right one. And um, <clears throat> uh, right, where am I now? Uh, share screen. Uh, get the right screen. There it is. How's that? Yeah, we've got that. Perfect. 
Yeah, everybody got that? Yeah. Okay, so what I'm talking about um, today is uh, how we can use the balance between specificity and generality of practice to en enrich athletic performance. Uh, and uh, that means through the development phases and in preparation for competition. I'm gonna discuss some of the science behind it, the theory, um, and maybe point to a few problems and issues, and then talk about some practitioner work, which may be pointing us in the right direction. Uh, so I'd be interested in hear any kind of uh, ideas on practical application of this notion. Uh, so if I move, I'm trying to move my screen on. Uh, there we are. Um, now, one of the one of the issues with applied science, um, uh, Joe Baker and I wrote a paper in 2007 where we criticized this uh, propensity of uh, applied science researchers to get into dualist thinking. And essentially um, what that means is, is a lot of um, concepts and ideas get pitted, framed as if they're a part of a debate. And there's a dualism that's going on. So, for example, Joe and I, in 2007, we were talking about this genes versus environment type of scenario. The, the idea that in order to become successful as an athlete, you either had to have the right genetic profile or uh, was it a case of you having the, the right environmental context in order to succeed at the highest levels? And I don't want to go on about that too much today. That, that's for another part of the sort of trilogy. Um, but essentially, the, the point I want to make is that specificity and generality of practice, training, learning um, has been an important principle in um, exercise science, in psychology, um, coaching, uh, and everybody has uh, understood it. But unfortunately, it's been framed as part of a debate. So here you've got three, uh, several titles of uh, research papers uh, and essentially they've been framed, um, you can see where they've been framed as a debate. You can either have specificity or generality um, and uh, it's a case of trying to test uh, which is better um, rather than focus on uh, understanding how they may complement each other. So uh, when I, certainly when I was trained as a phys, phys ed uh, specialist back in the 1970s, that, this was something that... Uh, I was aware of. Now, it's not a case of saying here, I'm not, what I'm not saying here is that there's something wrong with the specificity of practice principle or there's something wrong with the generality of practice principle. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is we need a, a, a different approach to it nowadays. And I think some contemporary pedagogical models of practice that help us to uh, adopt a different perspective on the relationship between specificity and generality of practice. Okay, Casey, from, you just want to just go on to presentation mode and then we can use the whole of the screen. Thanks. Yeah. So let's get that. that. Yeah. Sorry about that. That's it. Is that, it. Is that better? Yeah. Good. Um, so um, as you can see here from an ecological dynamics rationale, um, the idea is, is and I've spoken about this before, so I'm, I'm not going to spend too much time talking about it again, but the idea is that there is a continuum um, in which captures the information that's used to regulate action. So information regulating action is a key principle of ecological psychology as proposed by James Gibson. Um, and it's actually, a, we propose it as a key principle of practice task design in sport. And what we've said is, um, and can hope people can see the, my pointer arrow on the screen. Um, what we've said is, is that Essentially, uh, down at one end, you have more specifying information, if you like, that's the gold standard uh, for practice environment. So that in other words, if you want to become good at springboard diving uh, or at fast bowling in cricket, ice climbing, you have to experience uh, practice and performance in those specific environments because the information that you use to regulate your actions, um, it's specific to those environments. And what we said in ecological dynamics is that um, these environments have higher representative design or they're higher in representative learning design to paraphrase um, uh, Egon Brunswick's work in ecological psychology. So this end here 
practice environments, learning environments, training environments are more specific. And down at the other end of the continuum, they're more general because the information is non-specifying. In ecological terms, that means less useful. So for example, you've got some images here of um, uh, people practicing dribbling against static cones that don't really reflect the information that a, an active defender uh, poses. Or if you're batting against uh, a cricket bowling machine, you're not getting the information that a fast bowler delivers up front. Now, under normal conditions, what we're saying is that it's better to spend more time down here at this end here for enhancing skills um, and um, to, to make sure that training and practice and learning is more effective. But somewhere along this continuum, each individual needs to be placed um, depending on their journey, where they are, depending on if they're really at the beginning um, of their journey as a learner or if they're more advanced learners, somewhere along here, they need to be placed. And we've also given caveats that um, if, for example, you can't get to um, uh, a mountain uh, or a, a boulder, a, a rock to, to practice climbing, then an indoor facility will help you to maintain um, your climbing skills at a more general level. Um, now, the, the interesting thing with this pan, pandemic at the moment that we're all facing is that what we in the past have thought for elite athletes would be the cases uh, of not spending too much time at the more general end. That is actually probably more functional at the moment because of the lockdown situation where footballers can't play together in a team in, in terms of the social distancing principle. Um, Swimmers can't go into a pool um, and so on and so on. But typically um, along here, an individual would need to be placed in terms of a practice design by a coach. And that essentially means that the information is either highly specific or it's more general. So in a sense, this side of the continuum has a slightly negative uh, press from the point of view of um, the learning curve, the rapidity of learning. But there are, it's, we need a more nuanced understanding to be being down this end here, as I say, because we don't want to frame this specificity generality thing as a, as a debate, as, as a kind of a, a juxtapose against each other. It's about understanding when an individual needs to be down at this end here and why, and when an individual needs to spend more time at this end here and why. So some examples then of practice tasks, at uh, different locations on that continuum. Um, here you've got springboard diving, actually practicing, people who are springboard divers, practicing springboard diving. Uh, and here you've got the dry land facility where the task of springboard diving is broken up so that athletes in the Australian um, Olympic program, they can practice their um, hurdle step phase, the preparation phase, but obviously they won't land wrist first in the, in the foam, in the foam pit, they would land uh, feet first there. But the idea being that they're really focusing on polishing and improving one aspect of that performance here and then get more and more trials on the, on the hurdle step. And as I mentioned before, there's this issue of climbing in the environment, in mountains and ice falls compared to climbing indoors. Uh, and of course, in terms of fast bowling, if you're batting against fast bowlers, obviously this is a, a, a really highly demanding activity. And for example, Cricket Australia, they limit their young developing athletes to 36 deliveries per session. Uh, and if you're a batsman, you want to face fast bowling, uh, but you're going to run out of um, people delivering the ball to you. Um, it may be the case that you take advantage of um, batting against the ball projection machine. So this is more at the more specific end, in fact, all the top um, ideas, are, uh, the examples are at the more specifying end of that continuum. And the bottom examples would be where the athlete would be moved down at the more general end of the continuum. And again, it's not a case of saying one is wrong, one is right. It's more about understanding why an athlete is located at one end of the continuum and not another end of the continuum, depending on their individual needs. Now, 
Interestingly, I've been doing a bit of background reading in Russian sports science, and here I've got to acknowledge the um, uh, Ollie mentioned at the beginning, of, uh, and Ed mentioned at the beginning about the collaborative work that goes on. Uh, and I've really got to acknowledge the uh, influence of uh, a, the United States, the US swim coach, Andrew Sheaf, um, who switched me on to this idea that the Russian sports scientists were a bit ahead of the game when it came to understanding, taking more of a nuanced approach between specificity and generality. And and Andrew um, pointed me in the direction of some literature um, that helped me to understand more this idea of how um, we can take a complementary view of the relationship between specificity and generality of practice. And I'm going to refer to the work of Anatoly Bondachuk um, as a specific example, but there are other sports scientists from Russian era, including uh, Nikolai Bernstein, I'll talk about his ideas later on, that, that um, also uh, they contributed some good understanding to this relationship. So Bondachuk, um, uh, essentially he was focused on athletic throws, um, but he was interested in training, um, strength and conditioning training, but also skills training as well. And he identified two phases. He talked about a general preparation phase for performance, a GPP, as he called it, uh, and a specific preparation for, uh, phase for performance. Uh, and, and you could tell by the title that one is more aimed at gen, uh, developing general athletic capabilities and capacities, and one is more focused on sp specialization in a particular sport. Uh, and what Bondachuk noted, and this is just one example here, um, is he didn't frame it as a debate, uh, as an either or, a versus scenario, he talked about the principle of unity, uh, the need to understand that we need to look at generalize a GPP and SPP. Um, and so it becomes a timing issue. When does an individual need um, to be focused on GPP and how long for and why? And when does an individual need to be focused on specialized practice and training and learning how long for and why? And he indeed, um, I, I only noticed this um, a few weeks ago, he indeed had a continuum of practice designs based on from the jet more general, right the way through to more um, highly competitive, uh, if you like, more representative competitive exercises or training programs. And some of you who know the athletic skills model continuum will notice that these uh, Bondachuk's continuum of practice designs and the athletic skills model continuum, they're quite well aligned. So Bondachuk then, um, and this, this is um, information from his book that was translated into English um, in 2007. Uh, this is how he defined GPP, a means of all round development of the individuals. So in other words, this is really athletic enrichment. This is empowering individuals in terms of their capacities um, and such as agility, coordination, strength, etc. Uh, and then specialized uh, training programs, which uh, re are related to a particular um, specialization or in an in, um, event. Uh, and he, ad he advocated a mix of both GPP and SPP in training designs for athletes. Um, and rather than this uh, frame it as a debate, as I said, either or, it's about understanding how you use both and when and why. And interestingly, he talked about GPP as more general um, enriching type of um, activities, leaving traces which can interact with future variations in training. And this really resonated with me because we talk about this notion of skill adaptation. So in other words, it seems that according to, the, the, to people like Bondachuk, um, the GPP activities is really about empowering you so that when you get um, to a situation um, in a specialized performance environment, and you have to adapt, you can exploit those traces, the, um, the effects of the GPP that you've had um, in training, um, and that can help you to um, become better at adapting. Now, the point I wanna make here is, um, if you look at the uh, movement, the motor development literature, uh, GPP resonates very strongly with this notion of uh, foundational movement skills pr uh, proposed by Hulte et al, which really take, advances the notion of fundamental movement skills, 
um, more broadly, looking at them more extensively. SPP, the focus there is pretty aligned with representative design of Egon Brunswick, as I mentioned, and representative learning design of Ross Pinder and colleagues, uh, and a mix of both to empower an athlete so that when they get to specialized training, they can really take advantage of it. That really is what we mean by athletic uh, athlete enrichment um, in the new book that's just come out uh, uh, a month or two ago. So here you've got the two continuum that I talked about. At the top here, you've got Bondachuk's continuum. And at the bottom, you've got the athletic skills model continuum. Um, and the notion there is that you spend um, plenty of time particularly early in your development phase in general preparatory exercises or multi-sports phases, the athletic skills model says. And then the athletic skills models proposes the value of donor sports. That means, uh, for those of you who are not familiar with that concept, donor sports are sports that um, experience of which help you to become better in a target sport later on. Maybe this is what Bonchuk meant by leaving traces. He talked about this as a special preparatory phase. And then he talked about getting into the um, more specialized phase. And it's very similar to the um, athletic skills model where uh, the idea is, is that you, the, the technical adaptive training is really variation about around um, practice designs in a particular sport um, that you're seeking to specialize in. And then later on at the senior level of sports experience, individuals um, undergo a lot of specialized, uh, highly sp specific um, sports training and practice. Uh, and of course, the, some of you may have seen this before. So an example of a donor sport could be parkour training, where we've, um, we raised the, the, the idea that uh, parkour training could be a donor sport for team games players because it allows them to become um, dynamic, exploit agility, uh, balance, postural control, um, changing direction, that sort of thing. And Bondachuk would call this the special preparatory training phase. So is parkour a donor sport or could it be part of spe special preparatory training for um, an athlete? An interesting thing, just I'll just go back a minute, is that um, when you look at the athletic skills model, um, at, after the age of 19, when athletes are really at that specialization phase, there is an idea that um, athletes still need to spend about 30% of their time at this end of the continuum, the more general end of the continuum, 20% in donor sports and 10% still in the multi-sports phase. So when we talk about the timing, we're not talking about a linear approach, but we're talking about moving up and down the continuum, depending on the, on the individual's needs. Uh, and even as they become um, more experienced senior athletes, there may be needs to spend a little bit of time visiting this more general end of the continuum to develop their athletic skills. I personally um, wouldn't recommend placing an exact proportion of time um, at the more general um, athlete enrichment end because it depends on each individual. If you, if you really do accept the interacting constraints between an individual and a task and the environment, that will differ for different individuals. Some need to spend more, more time at the enrichment end and others might need to spend less time down there. Now, um, th this sort of thing, um, whilst it is relevant for understanding elite sport performance and um, how to develop top class athletes, it's also important from the point of view of general health and well-being and helping people to become better movers in life so that they can enjoy a physically active lifestyle. Even if you don't want to become um, a top class athlete, but you really do want to um, be the best that you can be at a sub elite level, or you might decide later on in life that you want to take up a, a sport. Physical literacy and physical education, I think is a very important concept. It's making a bit of a resurgence at the moment. And James Rudd and colleagues at Liverpool John Moores University, um, uh, we are seeking to look at how we can integrate it into an eco ecological dynamics um, conceptualization. And currently, I, I'm, we're working on a paper with uh, Marco Sullivan and Carl Woods, where we're looking at um, proposing how physical literacy in physical education can be integrated um, uh, 
uh, into an ecological dynamics rationale. So that would be really about how to start enriching um, physical uh, people's ability to move. Um, and it, that doesn't just, um, I mean, in some ways it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, uh, an unfortunate term, physical literacy, because it does seem to point people to looking at the physical aspects of movement behavior. Um, but really physical literacy from an ecological dynamics rationale um, should be focused on, uh, as, it, as it says in the top bullet point here, of, a, of forming an adaptive functional relationship between each individual in the environment. And that is actually focused on perceptual skills. If, if you are regulating your actions with information from the environment, you've got to be able to pick up and use information to regulate your actions. Your cognitive skills, your problem solving, your planning, your movement, reorganization, if you like. Um, and of course, then there's the physical component as well that's quite important. So, physical literacy is a very important aspect of. Um, of, uh, of, this, of this particular issue of specificity and generality um, of um, practice and training. So we get, we're getting now into the, I just wanna um, start to finish off by focusing on the, um, the mechanisms, if you like, about uh, how enrichment might work and why. Uh, and uh, from an ecological dynamics rationale really uh, there's several insights that you could draw upon, but I particularly want to draw attention to those of Nikolai Bernstein, who talked about the degrees of freedom problem. So he was a he was the Russian scientist, as I mentioned before. Uh, he did a lot of his work in the 1930s, got translated into English in, in 1967. Um, but Bernstein was really the first to draw our attention to the importance of coordination, focusing on coordination rather than motor control. And James Gibson, of course, as we know, really gave us a powerful uh, means of understanding the concept of information. So information and coordination, essentially, for me, captures the relations between specificity and generality of practice. And elsewhere, Duarte Rojo and um, myself, we've talked about this notion that we should be, if we are focusing on a, um, a functional relationship between an individual and the environment, and rather than talking about skill acquisition, as if somehow you acquire a skill as an entity and you store that somewhere in the central nervous system, it's better to focus on skill adaptation, adapting to um, not only the environment, but the changes um, in uh, your systems or subsystems from infancy right the way through, um, through to childhood. Uh, now, these person environment relationships change, and there's a whole host of reasons why they change. And interestingly, we've got a new one here. We've got a new constraint from an environmental perspective, which is that the relationship changes from the point of view of a pandemic, uh, which alters the way that you can interact with your teammates, with your environment, um, with your um, context of performance. Um, and there are still things you can do. There are still things you can do uh, and in, in some respects, we can learn from this current pandemic situation um, about how we cope with long term illnesses and injuries uh, for athletes and even, of course, the effects of aging um, in athletes. Um, I've, I've been reading a paper by Karen Adolph and Justine Hock. I think it's a great paper. It's worth a look at here. The reference is down here. And they pointed out, um, they do a great review of literature in um, motor development from an ecological perspective. And they pointed out that um, perceiving an affordance in one context does not directly transfer to another context. Um, the idea being that, for example, if you're an infant and you perceive an affordance when you're, um, you're at the stage of sitting upright for the first time or you're crawling, an affordance um, for an infant who's at stage or the same infant at the stage of standing and walking is not exactly the same. The process of perceiving affordances, picking up information and regulate your action, that's the same, but the affordances are not the same. And that really made me think about the fact that um, the affordances of uh, a climbing surface are not precisely the same, for example, 
um, it, it, you know, it, uh, on a climbing wall as they might be on an overhanging rock surface or uh, an ice fall. But the actual process is the same. So uh, I like this phrase here that um, uh, Karen Adolf and Justine Hock used, which they paraphrased um, Harlow from 1949. What they said was what this, this important point means here about using affordances, and they're not exactly the same, but the process is the same, is that people didn't really learn to move. More accurately, they learn to learn to move. And so if we design practice environments that facilitate people learning to learn to move, that would require a, a nuanced balance between specificity of practice, training, learning, and generality of practice, training, learning, etc. Helping people to learn to learn to move. Um, that could be one of the most important skills that they take with them throughout their um, career, whether it's sub -elite, in a sub-elite sport or elite sport. So learning to learn to move, then that's an important uh, mechanism of um, how um, generality and specificity can enrich um, an individual's skill adaptation process. Another one is, uh, this is Bernstein's insight here, of um, synergy formation. The idea being that this, there's an abundance of motor system degrees of freedom, and we shouldn't look upon that as a negative, but uh, as a positive, but it also gives us a challenge as well, because um, it's a case of compressing the number of degrees of freedom so that you can form synergies or coordination patterns amongst this um, uh, huge number. Uh, and, and on this side here, you've got uh, uh, some relevant papers, the relevant ideas of how synergy formation is an important part of this aspect of um, coordination. Um, and you can see that acquiring coordination or becoming better at adapting your skills to the environment, it's a question of timing is the point here. So this aspect here, um, this model on this, this diagram here, it shows you an individual simulating how an individual, um, uh, the, their landscape changes in terms of their uh, coordination. These are, these are attractors in, this, in the language of dynamical systems. So these are coordination patterns. And if you're engaged in uh, at spe specificity end of the practice environment, then these landscapes become quite stable um, and they're, um, they're also quite um, unique in, in that sense. They're specialized for different sports. On the other hand, at the GPP end, that's the more general end of athletic enrichment, the landscape would look a bit like this and the individual would be able to transfer, transfer between the different parts of the landscape, between different states of coordination quite easily because these attractor wells aren't as a deep. We need a, mi a mix of both. And it's, an, it's a question of understanding um, the timing, when you can uh, use, exploit self-organization and synergy formation in the motor system to uh, become adaptive, to be able to transit quickly between different uh, requisite coordination patterns and how you can then uh, take that into more specialized training environments um, so that you're not stuck in an attractor well, which means that you're not very good at adapting should you need to in a performance environment. And for me, this captures this aspect of skill adaptation and synergy formation. Uh, this captures this relationship, the importance of the relationship between specificity of practice and generality of practice, as proposed by um, Bondachuk and of course in the athletic skills model. So this is um, what would what would that look like? So these are the, this is an affordance landscape. Just focus on this at the bottom here. You can peruse this at your own time. Um, but essentially, people would have seen this before. The idea being that you've got an affordance landscape, a rich landscape um, of affordances, as uh, Eric Rietveld and Kiverstein have called this. And somewhere on this affordance landscape, that is, these opportunities for action, people are exploiting them in learning environments. Specialized training, the affordances seem to be narrower and quite unique to those specialized environments. More generalized training, the affordances are more rich, varied, more extensive. And as Bondachuk su suggests, maybe they leave traces, uh, a sort of empowerment factor that you could then take into the more specialized training um, and exploit later on. So, so you're able to adapt 
even to the variability of these more specialized environments. So bringing it to a close, uh, what I would say is regardless of whether you're at the specific end of the um, continuum of affordances and information to regulate actions or the more general end, you still need um, a particular approach to coaching, to pedagogical design, which elsewhere I've talked about safe uncertainty, the notion that we need to make sure that environments um, are not too certain for individuals, that there is a bit of uncertainty there, but they're safe. Uh, individual athletes are safe to explore them and to uh, work out solutions for themselves. So this is where you get the repetition without repetition that Nikolai Bernstein talked about. That is that athletes repeat problem solving rather than repeat or rehearse a specific movement pattern. This is where you get the dexterity that's encouraged, that mix of general and specificity of training where they can take risks, where they can self-regulate, they can explore, they can innovate, if you like, um, all guided by the coach. Uh, and that's regardless of which end of that continuum you're at, I would suggest that still this is the pedagogical approach that would uh, facilitate that linkage between specificity and generality that's needed in athletic enrichment. So uh, Ed, um, Oli, I'll stop there and we can open it up for comment, discussion or anything like that. Keith, that's uh, great. Thank you very much for that. Um, what I'll do is I'll hand over to uh, Alan and Phil, who are uh, managing the questions. Some great questions have come in on, on the comments on, on both Zoom here and, and also on YouTube. So, um, Phil, do you want to start first in terms of the comments that are on Zoom? And uh, Keith, you can uh, stop sharing your screen now. That would be great. Okay, Thank you. Great. Hi, right, so thanks, yeah. Ali. Yeah, yeah, just taking that through. Uh, thanks very much, Keith. That was great. And we've had several questions coming through both on, on um, YouTube and also in the, the chat here as well. I'm actually going to start because you started with going back to the historical perspective and talk about Henry's work and Bachman and, and, and his ladders. Um, the first question comes from Andy Abraham, who's also asking about the, the historical context of this. Uh, where the, the term generality came from. So uh, maybe I'll pass you over to Andy Abraham so he can ask the question himself and provide a little context. So Andy, I'll come to you and unmute you. And uh, yeah, Andy, you're unmuted now, so, so go ahead. Um, thank you for that. Uh, thanks very much, Keith. Good to see you. Um, yeah, you too, Andy. Feels like the last 25 years haven't happened. You haven't changed a bit. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, Keith, I thought you gave a, a really nice... Um, you know, view of, of the landscape within that, uh, and the talk, this idea of, of you know that there's, there isn't that we shouldn't be talking about duality. We should be talking about relativity. You know, things things work for different reasons for different times. Um, so uh, yeah, thanks very much for presenting that as a view, Keith. It's uh, really welcome. I suppose my question, when when you put your first slide up, um, and you're talking about specificity, general generality, my mind is immediately drawn to. You know, there's things which might be generally, well, in fact, generality seem to draw me more to what you then put up as, but that's uh, the sports, what you call it, the athletics, athletic skills model. It's, um, generality might be something that we gain by doing things like, like gymnastics, and that might transfer quite well. I've seen this a lot with my son from gymnastics to rugby. It's, it's been, a, it's been a, a major contributor, I'm pretty certain, you know, cause and effect and all that. But it just feels like generality didn't fit with what you presented. I'm just, it felt like generality was, yeah, I'm drawn towards general and intuitively it doesn't seem to fit with what you was presenting there, which were, I would have said was, if you go back to the other language of whole part, whole was more part based practice rather than whole based practice. I'm just wondering where that, um, how that term generality came, was arrived at, because it, it doesn't feel like an intuitively good fit. Um, well, this is it. Yeah, you, the, the interesting thing is when you go back to um, that era, and when I talk about that era, I'm talking about 1940s to 19, roughly 1970s. Um, there was this debate that was um, proposed. And actually, a lot of the papers were really 
interested uh, not so much in explaining pedagogical principles and uh, how people learn and how people practice. They were obsessed with assessment, with ranking, with producing tests that could predict um, uh, whether a, a, an individual and the scores on the test, whether that would predict that individual would become a good football player or an American football player or something like that. And when you look back at that um, time, and, and you know, uh, we've said in the past that the environmental constraints, you've got social, socio-cultural constraints that influence thinking uh, and, and they influence scientific thinking as well. The science was good uh, and actually quite um, rigorous. You know, people like Franklin Henry, um, was in physical education, had a great background in engineering and technology. Um, but the, for some reason, they were, um, they, were, they were really focused on this, um, can we produce a test that, that uh, we use a specific test for, foot, uh, for specific for footballers, specifically for swimming, or can we produce a more general test of what you could call motor educability? In other words, um, this test would pr predict that you have a good, rich, varied um, uh, movement skill set, which would then allow you to become uh, better at, at, you know, in a team games or, or whatever. And so at the time, uh, that was pretty much the thinking to do with, um, uh, you know, the, the use of IQ, ranking people in terms of their IQ, how they did on the 11 plus and uh, channeling them towards specific areas, you know, whether they're going to be, you know, in a sort of a, um, a, a, work, a, a job that required physical skills versus a job that required cognitive skills, for example. Uh, and so the socio-cultural constraints were the same. Um, and that's where the debate came in. And interestingly, the specificity side seemed to have won that debate, um, if it, whatever that means. Well, it still, still sounds like American football, so it's not that old, is it? What's what is it they use in American football? That thing they televise. The which what's that? The um oh um uh, uh, Sean Sean Sean, Sean oh, NFL that's combine. It, the combine yeah. 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 yeah yeah I mean that's exactly that isn't it? So <laughs> the, the Americans will love that they're using a Russian idea. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, Bondachuk actually, if you read the English translation, he wasn't that complimentary about the American. Uh, research actually so uh, i left that bit out because uh, i know i've got some good colleagues in the states so yeah. great thanks Keith. that's right andy all right so we'll back to phil um phil you got some other questions there yeah we have another question lined up uh this time heading over to derek or reardon um so derek really liked this idea about avoiding a versus mentality of one approach versus another. So Derek, I'll pass over to you to ask Keith your question and, and maybe provide any follow-up if needs be. Okay, Derek, you're, uh, you're unmuted, go ahead, please. Yeah, uh, yeah thanks. It was just uh, more, of a, more of a question for me because uh, my hesitance is always to be in, in one camp uh, or the other. Um, and notwithstanding the fact that you might have a an ecological view of, of how you're developing the athlete in its totality, no matter where you're placing them on that spectrum, is there scope uh, therefore um, to uh, adopt a number of pedagogies or pedagogical strategies uh, from that uh, uh, GPP to SPP um, and therefore um, have to work uh, across not just complex approaches to sports coaching, uh, but appreciate and adopt uh, maybe cognitive uh, and behavior as well as as well as complex and therefore working in a fairly interdisciplinary way across uh, approaches to sports coaching and not just rooting yourself uh, within that 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 complex approach or, or within an ecological approach a very very good question uh, Derek and uh, actually um, requires a really complex answer and I don't want to get into a really complex answer but um, uh, essentially um, the, uh, my answer would be that the ecological um, dynamics rationale also does discuss cognitive, uh, the cognitive subsystems, the, the functioning of cognitive subsystems. Um, 
it, what we've tried to do is, and I would advise this of people, is that you, you need to sort of, if you are going to plot your way through theories out there, the theoret theoretical frameworks out there, you, you need to uh, be co coherent um, because at certain key points, the theoretical, uh, the different theoretical approaches differ at key points. Actually, there's a, there's a lot of um, aspects where the, you could interpret the uh, concepts as similar, but there are key points where they do differ. And so you do need to adopt a philosophical stance that helps you to, helps to maintain coherence um, with it. So, um, I mean, uh, I, I'll, I'll, I'll say up front, I, I, this is a lot I like about the athletic skills model uh, because that's a, pr a practitioner model it was developed by René Vermout, who works for the, um, uh, the Dutch Football Federation. He's a skill acquisition and strength and conditioning coach. He, he developed that academy at um, Ajax, did fantastic work as a practitioner. Some of the, um, the approach, uh, the theoretical explanation that René takes, I'm not fully in agreement with. But who am I to question then that, you know, the, the sort of application of that because I actually produced so many top class footballers, the Dutch have done so well at the world level in football, you know, that um, it would be really churlish of me to say, no, I'd, you know, you've got that bit wrong, you've got that bit wrong, etc. I would take a different interpretation of it, um, theoretically. Um, and I would just say that if you do plot your way through, um, you just need to be aware of the distinctions between the different approaches so that at least you're coherent if you were to explain it to somebody. Okay, great. Uh, I think we've got some questions coming through on YouTube. So, Alan? Yeah, we've had some great questions come in on YouTube. Um, so, thanks to everybody who's watching on that. Uh, the first one comes from James Riches, um, and he's curious to know, um, would generality of practice be more appropriate in primary PE environments, where we may not be preparing children for sports, but more so to move confidently in life? Yeah, and this is where um, I think James Rudd um, and colleagues, they're looking at that. Um, and in fact, they've got evidence to, to show that it is, um, it is probably more important. And both, um, I mean, let's take the athletic skills model approach. Um, uh, Rene talks about the, um, the years between 6 to 12 to taking a, a more general approach to adopt a, a multi-sports approach. And so um, you build a foundation, you use a lot of play, you're motivating children to want to move. And that, that was why I was referring to physical literacy, which James and his group are looking at. And that fits well with an ecological dynamics rationale, because the idea is, is that um, you produce this foundation which supports you so that when you go to specialise, um, not only have you got um, physical aspects of movement, but you, you're also... Uh, used to the perceptual side of things, searching for information, scanning, etc., exploring the environment, using information to regulate action, using action to pick up information, plus the cognitive problem-solving side as well, that you, you are um, using those in a, in a really functional way. As I said before, you know, those rich, varied environments um, and, your, and that ability to adapt, that's what Bondachuk was saying, that's what we've said, argued in the skill adaptation paper that's what Rennie has argued in the athletic skills model that ability to adapt and um, e exploit um, form new synergies and reform synergies etc that is the the basis of it and I think that the maybe that you know at that sort of primary school level uh, for physical education that's where you can start that process and by the way you can carry that on. It's a, you know, James and colleagues, and we, we, this is one of the key principles that we're arguing is that that should go on through the life course. And I know, for example, that Leeds City Council, before the, the lockdown, uh, were operating parkour style, parkour style training for elderly groups um, in, in the Leeds area because it gets people moving, they're, they're using variability, and it's all functionally targeted at the um, capacities and skills of that group. But so it's through the life course. It's fantastic to see that that's being made available, um, especially for uh, a population that needs it more than most would think at times. 
Um, another quick question from YouTube is very interesting. I think it comes back to the earlier discussion about cricket uh, youth players and the reduction of the amount of fastballs they can play in the session. And it's from Kenny Carroll, who said that major league baseball batters in the US um, have been practicing the other way around. So instead of right-handed, they'd go left-handed. Um, and it was more so of a, an, in an attempt to keep them fresh and challenged. Um, to reduce overuse injuries um, and he's wondering is it worthwhile use of training um, and if so is it more prominent for youth athletes or older athletes? Well I think so I think it's certainly um, important in sports like say association football soccer um, because um, if you want athletes to be adaptive so in other words if they come across um, a very good defender so if, if imagine if you're an attacker you want to get a shot on goal um, but you can only shoot with your right foot. A really smart defender works you out quite quickly. And of course, you know, the, um, the higher the level you play, you, you worked out really quickly and they will stand on that foot. So they will always show you on the, on the, on the weaker foot. So you have to solve that problem by being able to exploit, um, you know, both limbs. And there's some good examples of uh, people that um, can solve the problem by, you know, transiting between the left and right limb. Some become super um, elegant um, and skillful in one limb as well, uh, but they're never completely, um, at the top level, they're never completely reliant on, on one limb. Um, I know that there, there, was a, there was a theory of crosstalk between the different hemispheres of the brain, and the idea being that um, practicing with a non-dominant limb could um, enhance your skill with a dominant limb even, uh, and those theories were tested and evaluated uh, around about the time I think Andy was at um, Andy Abrams was at MMU there was I seem to associate reading about that um, uh, at that time there um, and so there are some there is some uh, cognitive neuroscience research that seems to support that idea that you can transfer between uh, limbs that it's worthwhile as an enrichment perspective but equally it can help you to become more functional um, as an athlete as well. I've also seen research that looks at a strength perspective in that aspect where if you've got an injured limb and you continue to train the other limb, you may get a cross limb effect, mm. which is it's quite interesting to see that that research is being done. Mm. Um, another question from YouTube uh, from Sarah Keller, who we had uh, as our first webinar host last week. She was fantastic. Um, she says she loves the idea of learning to learn to move. Um, and would love to know more about the balance between specificity and generality to facilitate that in particular. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I really like that concept. And uh, during the week, I had a, a chat with um, a colleague um, and a coach actually in, in a high performance sport. Uh, and they really, they latched onto that. They loved that idea. Um, and, and, and by the way, um, if you, if you, it's not uh, just related to the academic world as well, because um, uh, in, a, in an interview recently, the All Blacks coach, ex All Blacks coach, Steve Hansen, when he was asked what makes a good All Black, and remember this is a nation that's won the World Cup twice and reached the semi-final other times. Um, and he said that um, the best All Black is the best learner. So learning to learn to move. Um, is, is resonant. So from a practitioner perspective, there's a view that that's in, important as well. To address the specific question raised by Sarah, um, I, I guess that um, there's no, as I said, I'm reluctant to allocate a specific portion, um, but, I, but I think there's certain principles that you um, apply. Um, and, and if you take the ecological rationale, which is you know, Newell's constraints-based approach, which is you've got the individual with individual needs, you've got the task, you've got the environment, and they interact. Um, and for me, that will be guided by the individual task relationship. So in other words, you look at each individual and someone um, may require more enrichment as a sort of a catch up, um, whereas others may require less enrichment um, because they've had such a rich, varied diet of multi-sports from younger. And maybe with the current generation of children, um, who have grown up with um, smartphones and digital media, uh, sedentary activities, etc. Enrichment might play more of a role with this generation compared to previous generations that played out in the street and made their own um, entertainment, if you like, um, through physical games in the environment. Maybe that's something 
uh, to consider. Um, so at that, yeah, so I, I would say that each coach would need to assess and be able to look at um, each individual athlete and then work out what their needs are and where they need to be on the continuum and why. And of course, to go back to that point before, to keep revisiting um, you know, the general end of the continuum, even when they're more experienced and senior, because injuries take their toll and aging takes their toll. And in, in a lockdown situation, you need to be adaptive as well and, and maintain skill. We're in the skill maintenance phase. Um, and so moving up and down that continuum um, can be important at different times. Great, thank you. Great. Thanks very much, uh, Keith and Alan. We're just going to come back to another question inside in the, the Zoom room here. So there's been a couple of comments about traces uh, and the idea of traces. So I'm going to go over to Tyler next. Uh, Tyler Yearby um, for the next question. Tyler, uh, you're on mute at night. Go ahead. Perfect. Thank you so much. First off, Keith, good to see you again. And thank you very Hello. much for your time. How are you doing? Good. Yeah, yeah good, good. Yeah, cheers. Uh, yeah, no, of course, a bunch of questions, but I'll, I'll just have one here so the rest of the, the lot can get to it. Um, can you define maybe what you mean or what you view as traces mm. and, and maybe how that lives? Because I think you can kind of get the idea or maybe why I'm asking. I don't want to put words in your mouth before you give your answer, but I'm curious what you view as traces in the system. Yeah, um, I can define what I don't mean. <laughs> um, and that takes us back to the um, 1940s to 1970s research where uh, this specificity generality of learning was focused on internal representations. And some people talked about these representation, representations being quite specific um, and they could be in an individual trace or template or a motor program uh, for a movement pattern. And others then said, well, now you'd have a storage problem. You'd have a, you know, the time constraints of selection and all this. So maybe we'll have a more of a generalized type of motor program. And I'm not really talking about that, um, that uh, element there. What I'm talking about, um, it would probably refer more to the, um, the, the, the dynamic landscape of attractors, the coordination patterns that an individual as in the intrinsic dynamics um, and having a sort of a, a rich uh, range of stable attractors. So for, that, so for, for people who are listening um, who um, are not familiar with what an attractor is, an attractor is a stable state of organization in um, a complex system. So a complex system, it could be an athlete um, or it could be a sports team, but let's take an athlete and a stable, stable state of organization could be a coordination pattern to achieve a particular goal. Uh, and so I think that um, the enrichment phase and the more general training gives you a foundation where you can exploit some of those stable states. You don't want them too stable. That's that's the problem with early specialization. As you, I, I know that you're aware of that, Tyler, in your work and, and, and Sean in your, in your group emergence. Um, uh, and it, you don't want them too stable from too young because there's a whole host of problems with that physically, psychologically, emotionally. But you really do want to get that landscape not too flat, but undulating so that there are traces of stability, which can then be exploited. So when you go to the specialization phase, you can make those um, uh, attractor states a, a little bit more stable, but you never want them too stable because, as you know, um, that means that you won't be able to adapt to the dynamic environment. I don't know if you want to add anything to that. No, that's that's wonderful. I appreciate it. I didn't want to put the the attractor wells in there and them being deep and, and them being wide. Obviously, looking at it as a as a you know a dynamic landscape, you're essentially surfing. That way, you can uh, become more adaptable to your environment. I, I guess my main idea was to hear you say that it wasn't a representation that was essentially <laughs> cemented, which I know that you feel that way. But I was just curious because. Um, I, I was wondering how you were going to award that because when we see that, I know how a lot of coaches are, being the fact that. Um, football specifically, American football here in the States, love a lot of Fonder Chuck's work. And so it almost it almost says that, oh, that what he was saying before is what we need to do. And the way that they're approaching his work is quite different than what he actually meant. They okay. mean it coaching a specific pattern. And yeah. so it's the language and the almost copious amounts of information that is coming along with that coaching 
is the part yeah. that uh, makes me a bit nervous in that situation. That's why I was yeah. asking. Good Thank point. So yeah, good point. Uh, and actually, um, you should. I think you probably know Andrew Sheaf, the uh, yeah. swim coach that I'm talking about, uh, and he's in agreement with you um, yeah. on okay. that. That it isn't about uh, you know coaching specific movements, but sure. about this adaptability, this functionality. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Yeah. Great, Tyler. Lovely. Thanks very much, Tyler. Um, so I think actually this is a nice time to go back to a question that uh, was raised earlier. Um, you know, if we're, if we're trying to get more coaches to, to adopt this, then the language that we use is really important. Um, so Russell has a question about the, the language that we're using when we're talking about this. Apologies, Russ. Come to you now. Hold on a sec. There you go, Russ. Over to you, mate. Hey, Keith. You're right. Hello, Rusty. How are you? Yeah, I'm good. I'm good. Long time yeah. no see. Um, yeah. 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 It was just. Uh, I mean, I just think it's generally for lots of people on the call, and it's been cool. I've had loads of messages, and Andy Abraham's already sent me some stuff, and uh, and Tim's told me he's doing some stuff. But I just think it's something to be thinking about. Is I mean, and it's cool because you keep it keeps me busy as long as the academics are using language here, and people are struggling to translate it. Yeah. Um, and I know that some. Uh, NGBs and sports do it better than others and you know so golden thread and things like that would be an attempt but I've just how mindful are you of like this landing with the vast majority of coaches so the 95% of people who coach for 40 hours a year um, and get most of their stuff off Twitter quite frankly where uh, I really enjoyed the stuff earlier but it's it's quite a bite it's quite a divisive debate at the moment as well so i enjoyed the fact that it felt softer here today is it something you you guys are mindful of yeah of course uh, absolutely you know um I, i've spoken recently and in the book the constraints led approach to coaching book um we've adopted that approach more coach focused and uh, practitioner oriented but uh and it's certainly not a case of overwhelming people with concepts but it's a tricky Balance because um, you could simplify things to the point where they become meaningless, uh, where they actually sound frivolous. Um, and but you can't go, you know, you can't go to that point. Really, I don't think it does anybody um, any good. But equally, um, it's important um, for people to understand that there is a, a conceptual framework there. Um, and, and and you know, I mentioned before uh, to Derek about being Derek O'Riordan to be about being. Um, um, uh, coherent to a philosophy, to an approach, you know, and not going off in all directions because otherwise you're like a, a cork bobbing in the tide, whatever the fashion is, you know. Um, uh, and th but there are some coaches who not only get it, understand it, and in the book, you know, we we um, sorry the uh, we'll talk about the the second edition book. Um, uh, the skill acquisition, the skill dynamics book, the second distance come out. We've got a chapter devoted to coaches who use it. A lot of them use the terminology and actually, actually apply it. I mentioned Andrew Sheaf before. He's getting, he's getting a lot of mentions uh, today. But, you know, he uses the language um, not with his athletes, his swimmers, uh, you know, but in discussions um, with um, academics and fellow coaches. So I guess it's about using the conceptualization at the right time and this is the coaching skill this is why i'm not a coach i haven't got that skill set which is that uh, if i were to uh, use some of these ideas with athletes learning whether they're senior more experienced or developing athletes it's about how to explain um, that to them or to or the coaches that you're mentoring you're advising how to explain these ideas in language that they would understand I think they'd probably follow enrichment, but I wouldn't get into that sort of, um, you know, the attractor states and um, uh, skill adaptation and things like that. I, I think they'd probably understand adaptive behavior and he helping athletes to become more adaptive, solve problems and stuff like that. And maybe keeping things at that sort of general um, level is probably the way to go um, rather than, you know, just to fling in concepts at that level. What's your thoughts? Um, yeah, I think it's just quite a tough place at the moment for coaches because 
I think some people have done some interesting stuff. So even uh, like Jack Pat's and stuff around actually your practice design and what are the options, what are the costs, what are the benefits? Um, I think people are starting to become more Ed Hall stuff around coaching behaviours. And uh, yeah, I, I think people are starting to discover. I think that the long words are quite a challenge. So even just using the word affordance for people can be suddenly, boom. Um, and I'm just mindful, you know, and there's lots of, people way more skilled than me and intelligent than me on this call. Uh, it's, you know, I just think it's something we, we've got to be mindful of because I think it's putting a lot of barriers up for people. Yeah, but, I think that's I also true. Get, I, mean, I also get that, you know, those words make sense to you and, and they're really important. So uh, I just wonder how we, because that is the 95, that's the huge majority of coaches. Yeah, there, but, you know, um, I mean, that's a good point you made there, but there are um, some good people that may, you know, I, I'm sort of maybe touting them for uh, consultancy money there to support coach education, but people like Marianne Davis at uh, yeah. UK Coaching, Marco Sullivan, uh, Carl Woods, uh, you know, people like that, they, they've worked in high-performance sport, they've worked with athletes, they understand, you know, Rick Shuttleworth, we, you know, we know that Rick, that's, Part of his skill set so there are people out there who are good at that all i can say is um don't look at me uh, i'm sort of probably one step behind that to if you like transfer the knowledge to the coach educators and the um uh, the, the the applied practitioners who get it um but the ones working at the coalface yeah they, they, they need to use language and develop those skills where they can communicate those ideas in a way that does not overwhelm people. You've definitely named some good, uh, some good crafts people there. Good, yeah, good role models, and don't forget yourself as well. So, um, absolutely, yeah, Russ. Thanks for that question. Uh, just going to pop over to probably got about five minutes quest, uh, left. I'm just mindful of time. Uh, there's lots of questions coming through, so apologies to those that we don't cover either on on the Zoom or on the YouTube. Um, but Ed, you, you kind of had a general question for, for for Keith in terms of coaching advice. Yeah, um, Keith, thank you so much. It's 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 been it's been absolutely blockbusting to be honest. I have my pages of notes here, um, but there is one one particular I think constraint that we're all experiencing right now that you mentioned yourself is the is the impact of COVID nineteen and how it's how it's I suppose creating many different things for people to you know to experience either in their backyard and getting people back out into their backyard again where maybe they they weren't spending too much time in the past. But one of the concerns I suppose I'm seeing is that uh, there's there's an explosion of videos coming out at the moment from coaches and it is great. A lot of them are, are great, but there's also a lot of them with huge amounts of explicit information from the coaches. And it's, it's a bit like the, the comment from Tyler that he was saying there's, there's copious amounts of information now coming back into the space. And I suppose, w are there any concerns from your end where, you know, if there was, if there was maybe a shift moving towards a more exploration with coaches and, and coaches to say, look, Go and figure it out. Go and go and problem solve. Here, here's here's just some good um, basic rules around the game that we've maybe altered the dimensions or whatever of the of the space that that we may actually be potentially you know make take taking a step back with now so much as a result of COVID nineteen so many videos of explicit instruction based videos from coaches. Really good point, Ed. Actually. Um... And I mentioned before about this sort of trilogy that I've got this sort of uh, Netflix series that I'm, you know, my personal Netflix series that's not on Netflix at all, uh, that's coming up in the next month or so. And I'll be exploring that in other um, presentations and things. But yeah, you know, I mean, I think that um, the important thing is to look for the principles. And, and whenever I've written, uh, to go back to Rusty's um, comments, I've tried to provide some principles that people can use um, captured in sort of fairly, you know, hopefully not too overwhelming language, like things like skill adaptation, the idea of adapting uh, your skills um, to a, in a, a context, etc. cetera. Um, things like that, affordances, they're opportunities or invitations for action. They invite certain behaviors of people. Those sorts of principles you can use to design your learning environments. And, and I, I still think that regardless of the situation that you're in, the socio-cultural constraints, etc., cetera, um, those principles still apply. And whether you're at the highly prescriptive end of that um, um, 
coaching continuum or exploratory end, the same principles apply. So even if you were uh, working with an athlete and you wanted to use verbal information, um, it's about, it's about um, practice is from an ecological dynamics perspective is always search. Practice is search. And so the verbal is not telling you what solution uh, you, you know, you got, but it's, it's about guiding you to a part of the landscape to search. That's all it is. You're using it like that. So, so that sort of principle can help you there, even in using the most fundamental of coaching behaviors. Um, and, and the, the, you know, the theoretical framework captures those ideas. Um, an interesting point about the pandemic uh, as a, 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 like an immense social cultural constraint, and I'm not trying to downplay its influence on ordinary people's lives, and it's, it's absolutely horrific. But when we're talking about exercise, physical activity, sport, um, and training at sub-elite and elite levels, etc., it's really um, at this phase, it's um, about skill maintenance. It's um, like a lot of things, it's turned things in society completely upside down. So things that were not considered to be um, functional, certain ways of behaving, etc., not considered to be functional, you know, learning, practice design, are now functional because we're in a, an extreme environment, etc., and the best that you can do, you know, I, I guess I guess what I'm saying is that it, it's pushing us more towards that general end of the continuum, a really powerful constraint thrusting us there. Well, I think and the best that we can do is is maintain skill, maintain strength, conditioning, etc., so that when you go back to the specialised end, and this is for the, for the elite athletes, it's just fine tuning, it's coordination, it's timing, it's all that sort of thing, you know. Um, and so this is where some of the, that GPP, general preparatory um, performance activities, this is where that can almost like a, a, a to, to go back to Tyler's comment, leave that trace that you, of enrichment that you can then explode from like a sort of springboard to get into the um, specific end. And we can learn from it because maybe what we can do is use these principles to work with athletes got a long-term injury or a long-term illness or aging and they've got issues to do with um uh you know a, a, an aging skeletal muscular system etc maybe we can use some of those principles of general enrichment um to facilitate their transition to the uh back to the performance environment and for long longevity in the performance environment so so a great I, question I really I really like that because the two words that I jumped all over in there that you said even a few times was the idea of exploration and search that mm. I, a lot of these videos do not leave it open for the athletes yes. that then watch and fix something out. They give all the information. They tell them exactly what to expect. They tell them what they want to do. And it's just, I love that, as I said, that even with the constraints that we're in, leave room for people to still have to explore and search, even in the constraints that we're dealing with right now. Yeah, and, 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 you know, play, let, let kids play, let, let people play. Even adults like to play as well. Let them problem solve, set them challenges, a choice, uh, bring in um, some sort of issue that they have to resolve, etc. You don't have to um, be practicing in a very linear way, going from point A to point B. There could be paths to explore along, even, even in a very rudimentary way. That still should be a, a fundamental principle. Great. Brilliant. Thank you. Right. Last question to come through from Phil. Oh, so I think we've got uh, one last question we have time for from uh, Ross Bashir. Um, and Ross is, is talking about uh, quite a specific problem, which I think is a nice way to, to close it up. So over to you, Ross. Ross, you're uh, muted. Hi. hi there. Can, can you hear us, guys? Yeah. 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 Ross, yep. so, sorry about that. Uh, thanks, Keith. Um, I'll just slightly change my question that I put in earlier because I'm very aware you said about not being a practitioner yourself but just in terms of looking at what you talked about with uh, generality moving to um, the specifics would you advocate the use of donor and multi-sports um, in the warm-up and early in session if they're going to provide affordances that that would link to your session intent yeah yeah that's great great point I think um, donor and multi-sports play multiple uh, roles across different timescales. So you're talking about the timescale of the warm-up, 
before a particular competitive environment and to get you into a ballpark area um you know i i, I guess it's if you like it's a sort of um, enrichment where you can spring straight into action quite quickly but you know over a longer time scale um with developing athletes you can use donor and multi-sports to be learning and gaining those skills which they can then use to specialize because don't forget at that age um actually we're not sure what's a donor sport and what's a specialist sport for for a, for a young um, child learning because um you know the uh, as, when i talked to Rene about this he said i said to him um you know you, you take this approach and there's a there's a bit of a danger that um, a kid in a, a football academy like Ajax might go, do you know what? I really enjoy um, sprinting or I'm, I want to be, um, you know, um, uh, I want to play basketball or something else. I really enjoy that side of thing. And he said, that's fine. He said, that's fine. As long as they are being the best that they can be. And so we've got to, uh, I think your, your question is, is really uh, fundamental because it suggests that the donor sports, multi-sports experience can be used at different timescales as warm up um, for obviously for, for conditioning as well um, and also um, as development for developing an athlete across uh, different timescales and across uh, across the life course as well so you can revisit that when you're older um, you know to, to make sure that you're still um, functionally moving in a good way when it go when you go back to your specific environment. So it, I think uh, I guess the fundamental point I'd say there would be that your question as a is relevant across different timescales. Okay, thanks for that. Cheers. Okay, Ross. Yeah, good question. Great, um, Keith. Unsurprisingly, we, we've had far more questions than than we have time for. Um, so uh, unfortunately, I, I'm just conscious of time. So what we'll do is we'll, we'll wrap up now. Um, but maybe maybe there's opportunity to send some of the questions that have come through to you um, just so you can get a flavour of them. Yeah, um, yeah. So, Keith, just, just a huge thank you for your time, um, for really stimulating presentation and, and discussion. Um, and I'm sure everyone, everyone would agree it was, it, was, it was really interesting. So it's great having you on here this evening. So, so really appreciate that. Yeah, great. And, and uh, just a final comment there, um, you know, after... Um, what you said as well, and uh, you and Ed, I mean, and, and Alan and Phil, you're doing a great job, um, you know, MSAI in uh, Cork is really wonderful. Um, it runs, um, you know, every other year to kiss Calio, and it, it's got that sort of atmosphere, um, uh, interactive um, atmosphere, and, and yeah, just keep, keep up the good work, guys. I think it's just absolutely fantastic. So thanks for inviting me. Thanks, Keith. And uh, thanks to everyone for, for tuning in the webinar and on YouTube Live. You can, everybody can keep up to date with future webinar announcements on our Twitter page, which is at MSA Ireland. And we do have some great guests lined up, so, so keep an eye on Twitter. Also, any feedback, please, can you send that through? It'd be great to hear from you um, about ideas or thoughts on the webinars or, or thoughts you might have for future webinars. Um, our recording of this webinar and, and, and previous recordings um, will also be available on YouTube. Also on our YouTube channel are uh, keynote speaker recordings from our 2018 conference. So uh, please check that out. So hopefully everybody has a great weekend. Thanks for tuning in and uh, we'll see you all again soon. Bye everyone.